Hi. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for everyone for inviting me. What's oh yes, I do have um, do have a little handout which is not so substantial, just to help you a little bit. Uh, it's one page for one, you everyone. Uh, uh, and it's you know just so that you know it's a little mnemonic at certain points, so that I don't always have to go back and. Uh, 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 change uh, something like, you know, go back to the slides and so on. So, um, well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is a talk called, um, entitled Reasoning with Epistemic Modals. And what I basically want to do today here is to uh, make a point for, for the claim that um, epistemic modals um, pose some kind of interesting challenges for our traditional conception of how to reason with modal um, information. So there's really something like a good reason when you have like a cognitive science when you're interested in reasoning to talk a little bit about epistemic models because they really are in some important respects really interesting. So that's what I uh, want, that's what one of the main uh, take home messages that I want to bring home um, today. So uh, the overview uh, is going to be pretty straightforward. I want to actually present a puzzle since I'm a philosopher, we are interested in puzzles. Uh, I want to present a puzzle. I want to, um, a puzzle that epistemic models pose for the uh, classical uh, modal logic. And then I want to connect that puzzle with an important observation about belief revision. Use the puzzle to motivate a non-classical outlook on epistemic models. Explore the implications of the solution for logic and reasoning a little bit more detail and then conclude with some remaining questions so that you all feel that there is much more to do to be done, which in fact it is. Um, so let me just dive right into the material. Um, I mean, fortunately, Elizabeth has already uh, uh, done like a little bit of a groundwork so we can be a little bit quicker here so that we have room for uh, the Q&A. Um, uh, you know, um, when you ask, okay, so what are epistemic models? Well, then, you know, the best way is normally to start with examples. Examples of epistemic modes are things like, you know, the keys might be in the car, um, or, you know, in a murder mystery, the gardener must be the murderer, uh, things like that. So epistemic models say what might or must be the case in light of some body of information as opposed to, um, you know, like deontic must, for example, something like, you know, you must pay your taxes, which seem to say what is necessary in light of some body of norms or something like that, right? So that's what makes models epistemic. Um, I will use the following notation here um, that is already familiar from what Elizabeth has been done. I'm using the box and uh, the diamond uh, to say it might be the case at P, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, um, how to reason with modal information, including epistemic modal information, that is originally what modal logic is supposed to tell you. Yeah? So modal logicians are something like you know, telling you about the, the, the norms or the laws that govern reasoning with modal information, with information about what is possible and necessary, okay? And folks have been interested in that actually like since the ancient times, you know, like, you know, Aristotle started with modal syllogistics and so on. Uh, so at least, um, you know, at least already back in, back in those days, people started thinking about modal logic and of course, you know, 20th century has made a humongous uh, progress in uh, modal logic. So modal logic is supposed to tell you uh, what, uh, how to reason with modal information, and I will not dive into the details here because if I were to do like, you know, something on modal logic, that would already eat up the whole time. Rather, what I want to do is to show you that why epistemic models pose a problem for classical modal logic given minimal assumptions. So what I'm actually going to do is to pull out certain kind of commitments that come with classical modal logic, and I'm going to tell you why this kind of model about how to reason with modal information is going to be problematic in light of what, um, you know, some basic considerations about epistemic modality. So I'm going to start with this little um, puzzle. It's actually not a puzzle. It's supposed to be a case from everyday life. Um, so it shouldn't be puzzling um, uh, in general. So um, suppose that, you know, you're in the follow following epistemic situation. You do not know where Mary is, but you do know that she's either in Chicago or in uh, New York. Um, there was a reason why I didn't put Montreal. Right, because it's Mary. 
So if I had like, if I had chosen Montreal as a location, I would, could not have used Mary as a person for complicated reasons. But, uh, um, so that's why it's Chicago or New York, sorry. Uh, uh, you also know that, so she must be one of these two places, and you also know that her biolocation skills, you know, so a lot, you know, philosophers have told us something important when they told you can't be at the same space at the same time, at a different space at the same time. Uh, so her biolocation skills are limited, so she cannot be in both cities. Then it seems, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you can say about the scenario, but it seems natural to say in this scenario that Mary might be in Chicago, she might be in New York, if Mary's not in Chicago, then she must be in New York. If Mary's not in New York, then she must be in Chicago. And Mary cannot be both in Chicago and in New York. I hope these are like, you know, I mean, these should strike you as trivial things to say in this kind of situation. Okay, so the first observation then is that if I form, a, you know, that the following five claims are um, consistent, yeah? Um, in fact, that's the kind of stuff that I'm believing in this kind of situation. And I'm using like, you know, this little um, exclusive or to signify, you know, standard like she marries in Chicago or in New York, but it is not the case that she's in Chicago and in New York. So that's exclusive or, either or. Um, I have my conjunction of my two might claims. Um, I have the claim that it is not possible epistemically that she is in uh, Chicago and in New York, because I know that she can't be in both. And then I have like these two little claims here, these conditional statements. And I'm using here standard notation actually for a distinct reason, because I don't want to make quite a commitment yet about how you want to analyze these kind of claims. But these are supposed to signify if she's not in Chicago, then she must be in New York. If she's not in New York, then she must be in Chicago. Um, and again, I'm you know dodging a few commitments here. but. Uh, I want to make a following, I want to make a claim about these kind of conditionals. So consider the claim, if Mary is not in New York, then she must be in Chicago. Assume that you know, Mary is not in New York, so she must be in Chicago. I claim that this is a pretty good argument. That has some intuitive appeal. That's how we reason with these kind of modal uh, um, conditionals. And so the um, second observation that I want to make if I can switch the slides. Uh, the second observation is that modal conditionals seem to be governed by the following general principle. If you are committed, or you know, if a set of premises entails a phi them psi, well then, you know, if you strengthen that premise with phi, then, you know, that's going to entail psi, which is, of course, just to say that modal conditionals support, you know, this inference rule of modus, modus ponens. Modus ponens means the kind of thing like if p then q, p, Therefore, Q. And again, I mean, I hope you know everybody feels at least some intuitive appeal that this is how we reason with um, conditionals. Okay, so these are basically just my two observations, um, or you know, or what I want to account for. I want to account for a certain kind of consistency observation, and I want to um, say something about what kind of inferences conditionals license. And I now want to show that well, if I put these two things together and combine them with um, stuff that classical modal logic gives me, things are going to blow up, okay? Not blow, I mean, it's like, it's not, like not terribly sad, I mean, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a bummer if you're, like, theoretically interested in stuff. So I have classical background, I mean, life goes on, right? But, you know, so, so as a classical background constraint, I have the duality that possibly phi is just, you know, not necessarily not phi. Um, I have my inference rule of reductio, you know, so that's the kind of thing that if a set of premises together with phi gives you, you know, the bottom, which is a contradiction, yeah, I could also, you know, write frowny face or something like that, well then, you know, that set of premises is already going to entail uh, not phi, the negation of phi. Um, I have monotonicity. So if a set of premises, you know, if, if, you know, set of premises sigma entails uh, psi, then of course, you know, once you throw in another premise, well, that's still going to entail psi. Um, and I have um, two other principles which are actually just, you know, in there so that, you know, the presentation is, you know, everything is neat. You don't really have to worry about that. But there's this distribution principle that if a set of premises entails a material conditional, the necessary material conditional, 
and the necessity of the antecedents, and it also entails the necessity of psi, and you have necessitation, basically, if a, a formula is a, necess a um, tautology, then putting the box in front of it is fine. These are actually just, you know, just in the back, just for completeness sake, these are uh, two kind of claims that are going to be more important. So, claim to recall is that if I have these kind of um, tube observations and I have these kind of background constraints, things are not going to end up um, pretty. So, uh, the claim is our two observations are incompatible with these background constraints. Again, these are on the handout, so I don't have to jump back on them. Okay, so what, is I'm, what I'm going to do now is two things. So, first of all, I'm going to basically give an informal articulation of the problem. And you're going to say, well, something like that I'm, uh, you know, that I basically played a you know, trick or something like that, you know, this is all stupid or something like that. And then I'm going to go through the problematic argument that I'm going to give you in a little bit more detail and actually going to tell, show that it actually follows like in classical um, logic. So, so here's basically an informal articulation of the problem. Assume that Mary is not in Chicago. Well, then she must be in New York because of my conditional. So it's not the case that she might be in Chicago, but she might be in Chicago. So I basically, under the assumption that Mary is not in Chicago, reason myself into a contradiction that she might be in Chicago, and that is not the case that she might be in Chicago because she must be in New York. So that's a contradiction. So by reductio reasoning, she is in Chicago. Wait. And then, of course, for parallel reasons, I can infer that she is in New York, and so I can conclude that she is in Chicago and in New York, which is, of course, you know, inconsistent with my assumption that she can't be in Chicago and in New York, or that she isn't in Chicago and in New York. Now, of course, you say, like, okay, wait, 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 this, there must be something wrong. And now the idea is, no, there's actually nothing wrong here. Let me be a little bit more precise here, then, to really show you that there is something going on here. So let sigma, the big sigma, be once again the premises consisting of 1 to 5. So um, notice here that since uh, if Mary's not in Chicago, she must be in New York as one of the premises, of course sigma is entailing it. So we have then, because I want modus ponens, that the result of strengthening sigma with not C is going to entail that she must be in New York because of the modus ponens constraint. Um, since I have uh, that she can't be both in Chicago and in New York. I also, because of monotonicity, have that even under the assumption that she's not in Chicago, that she can't be in Chicago and in New York. Perfectly fine. So, since I have, on the one hand, not possibly C and uh, NY, and necessarily NY, it's actually going to follow that necessarily she's not in Chicago, or she must not be in Chicago, and therefore by duality, that under the assumption that she's not in Chicago, that it is not the case that she might be in Chicago. But of course, you know, also because I have it at one of my basic commitments that she might be in Chicago, under the assumption that she's not in Chicago, she still might be in Chicago because of monotonicity. And you can see then that I get a contradiction here because I have not possibly C and possibly C. So therefore, under the assumption that she's not in Chicago, I get uh, a contradiction. And so therefore, by reductio, I can conclude that it follows from the premises that she is in Chicago. And of course, I can do the same thing for New York. So under the assumption that she's not in New York, I'm going to run into a contradiction. So sigma is actually entailing that she is in Chicago and in New York. But I also have that she can't be in both places, or that she isn't in both places. And therefore, I do get a contradiction out of this stuff. So um, there you have it. So I didn't screw up. Right? So there is really something like a problem. I'm going to say a little bit more about my methodology in a moment. Right? But, um, so first of all, why this is a problem? Well, it is a problem because um, it challenges classical modal logic. The key question is actually then at the end of the day how in modal logic you want to analyze um, three and four, my conditional statements. So you can be what I may call a narrow scoper. So you basically have the idea that if Mary is in Chicago, then she must be in New York as a material conditional of the form um, with antecedent that Mary is in Chicago, uh, that she is not in Chicago, and then the consequent being the necessitated um, um, consequent 
That is going to give you modus ponens, so that's going to satisfy my second observation. But that is actually going to sacrifice consistency. So then everything is going to be inconsistent. Or I can be a white scoper. I can let the modal take the scope over the material conditional. That gives you consistency, but it's going to sacrifice modus ponens. <clears throat> so in general, so something like the, the case seems to enforce within the context of classical modal logic an unhappy choice between modus ponens and the consistency of one to five. Okay, so this is basically like the puzzle. So now I want to make like a little remark because we're not all, you know, philosophers. So the point is not to give you like something like a, you know, like a case that, you know, pardon my French, which is non-existent, my, you know, that sucks, right? And then basically just be annoying, but rather the point is here to, you know, something like present a puzzle which actually calls for an escape route. Um, so ideally, basically, these kind of puzzles and paradoxes show you that something like, you know, the classical way we think about, or, you know, the common way we think about something, for example, reasoning, is just, you know, inadequate in some important way, okay? And puzzles are supposed to show you that, philosophical puzzles at least. Um, ideally, of course, you know, you're not only having a puzzle, but you actually, they provide some insight into the nature of human reasoning, about what human reasoning is, how we should think about it. And part of what I want to do is I want to consider one escape route that highlights why the puzzle is of substantial interest. So not only why you have like a puzzle here, a curiosity, but really why it tells you something. And, um, you know, the spoiler is that the escape road that I'm going to point out here is to target the classical assumption that logical consequence is actually uh, mon uh, monotonic. So going back to, uh, you know, again, the monotonicity principle was that if a set of premises entails psi, then of course, you know, um, you want uh, it, you know, the, the result of strengthening those premises with some additional bit of information is going to entail psi as well. Now, is this a plausible principle? I think, well, it depends on how you want to think about logical um, consequence. So, um, so, for example, if you think about logical consequence the way normally logicians like to think about it, like namely as guaranteed preservation of truth at, say, a point of evaluation, something like, well, if all the premises are true, then the conclusion is guaranteed to be true. Um, then, you know, I think monotonicity has a lot of appeal because, you know, if a set of, if a bit, certain bits of true premises are sufficient to entail the truth or to guarantee the truth of the consequent, of your conclusion, then of course, you know, going to throw in additional information is just going to be overkill. I mean, yeah, it's already guaranteed to be true. So, you know, giving me more truth is not going to change anything about that. So I think that if you're like in this kind of mood about what logical consequence does, then I think, you know, monotonicity looks in pretty good shape. But, you know, assume that you want to really think about logical consequence as a guide to reasoning in the sense that, you know, what are my rational commitments if I have hypothetically committed to um, a bunch of premises, a bunch of information, then you might actually think that uh, monotonicity, well, is actually maybe not really terribly plausible. And in fact, if you think about monotonicity like that, as the kind of thing which is really like going to give you a guide to reasoning in the sense, okay, so what should I believe, given that I have certain bits of information taken on board, hypothetically or not, then monotonicity is in fact reminiscent of a quite controversial principle from a very different field. Um, uh, or, you know, at least not from a field from logic, because it's going to really then connect with what folks have talked about in the um, belief revision literature. In fact, under this kind of conception of monotonicity is going to look pretty much like um, the principle of preservation. So suppose you have the following. Um, the following is the case. Um, you have um, uh, psi, which is accepted in a state of... Uh, information, so you already have committed to psi. Um, you are not committed to not phi, basically something like, maybe ideally, yeah, you are ignorant about phi, so it could be, you know, Mary could be in Chicago, she could not be in Chicago, I don't know. Then the result of revising that state of information S, which I used with a little circle for, 
remains committed to psi. Um, that is basically the preservation principle. The preservation tells you, okay, if you're already committed to psi, um, you are not committed to not phi, then the result of revising your information state with phi is still, you're still going to be committed to psi. And the intuition behind this is basically information economy or, you know, commitment economy. Because, you know, since you have been like something like, you know, the adding phi to your information didn't force you to withdraw anything because you weren't committed to its negation, uh, so that basically tells you in preservation, well, if, if that's the case, then just don't throw out any of your old commitments willy-nilly. You know? uh, so it's basically like an economy principle that we don't want to kick out um, uh, commitments uh, willy-nilly. Um, this is like a danger zone here. I get like double. Um, so, uh, yeah, if it's a short one. Uh, good, so I'm going to, hmm? yes, yeah, <laughs> what means committed, uh, roughly speaking, uh, committed means that um, the, uh, what you believe, right, is already in some way, the information that you believe is entailing uh, the information carried by psi. Uh, what, what means proof here? Oh, I see, yeah. So, so, right, so your deductive, if you want to think about a deductive system, then to be committed or to be accepted basically means, well, you can deduce psi. Um, to be not ex committed to not phi basically means, okay, well, you can't derive not phi, at least. And that may, in one way, that one may in one sense be because it's incomplete, yeah, so. Um, good, okay, so that's, that's the idea, yeah. So uh, I will give you a little bit of a more formal way of modeling what commitment means momentarily, but here I want to be a little bit non-committal about what's going on, uh, how to exactly model that. Um, so I hope that, you know, preservation as a principle sounds very pr plausible because it is just, you know, information or commitment economy, but there is actually going to be a problem that's a problem that has been observed, you know, by, in the late 90s, um, uh, late 80s by people like Levi, Fuhrmann, and, um, and Roth. Um, because, you know, suppose that I have a little bit more assumptions about revision. Suppose that I have the principle of success, which basically means that the result of revising S with phi is committed to phi. I have um, consistency, which means that, well, if S is consistent, and as, as long as phi is not a contradiction, then the result of revising S with phi is consistent, which is basically to say, don't screw up unnecessarily. Um, and, uh, you know, like uh, the principle of what I call force here, um, assuming that S is consistent, then S is committed to, uh, it might be that phi only if it's not committed to not phi. So basically, if you are already committed to not phi, then you shouldn't be committed to might phi. <laughs> Right? So if, you, if you're committed to Mary not being in Chicago, then you shouldn't be committed to, it might be that she is in Chicago, epistemically. Um, and I have the principle of modesty that certain states can be committed to a possibility statement without being committed to any um, distinct, succinct answer to this kind of um, question whether or not phi. These kind of principles, plausible as they are, are once again going to clash, and they're actually going to clash with preservation here. Why? Well, because take any such state, um, S must be consistent, because otherwise it would be committed to phi and actually also to not phi. Um, so the result of revising, and, and moreover, phi must be um, contingent. So the result of revising S with not phi is going to be consistent. But it cannot be because of preservation. Because, you know, clearly S is committed to not phi, that's, you know, what success gives me. If its preservation is true, then it's also going to be committed to possibly phi. And so, therefore, by force, it's got to be inconsistent. So, once again, you know, something like, so here, this is actually like a you know, familiar result from the belief revision literature. 
Um, I mean, the interpretation is a little bit, you know, people fight a little bit about how to interpret it. But of course, you might want to say, okay, uh, that seems to show that um, uh, there is something like a problem here with preservation. And it's also, I mean, kind of intuitive that preservation should fail once we consider epistemic might. Because epistemic possibilities disappear in light of novel information. That's just what learning is. Learning is, to some extent, ruling out ways the world could be, epistemically speaking. Yeah? If you learn that Mary is not in Chicago, that means that you, know, you are no longer taking it to be an epistemic possibility that Mary is in Chicago. Did I say, so you're learning that she's not in Chicago, then it's no longer an epistemic possibility that she is in Chicago. So learning is just information strengthening, and information strengthening basically means that less and less possibilities are compatible with what the information that you carry. And since intuitively might commitments are sensitive to epistemic possibilities in the sense that the might commi a commitment to Mary might be in Chicago seems to be depend on there being the epistemic possibility of Mary being in Chicago, they shouldn't be guaranteed to be preserved by novel information. And that if you think about, you know, if you think that preservation is a problematic principle that um, novel information does not preserve your commitment to might statements. Yeah? That's going to put conceptual pressure on monotonicity as well, if you think about monotonicity as a guide to reasoning. Because monotonicity, if you think about it as a guide to reasoning, is basically telling you, okay, so you are committed to possibly phi. You're learning like a new bit of information, and then because of monotonicity, you are still supposed to be committed to possibly phi. And you know, if you don't believe in preservation, then you shouldn't believe in that kind of prediction about monotonicity. So that's actually one um, uh, uh, moral that I want to draw here, is that from a belief change perspective, monotonicity is reminiscent of preservation, but we do not want to have preservation, at least if we are committed, uh, at least if we are wondering about um, epistemic possibilities or commitments to might um, to, to epistemic possibility um, statements. And specifically, we would like to say that epistemic possibility commitments are not preserved under information strengthening. So we would like to say that a set may entail a possibility claim, but not if strengthened with a certain bit of additional information. And that is just going to be um, non-monotonicity. Okay. So, um, so that is basically like something like the moral that I wanted to do, the, the, the motivation that I wanted to put on. Um, I have looked at a classical, logic, uh, classical model of uh, logic and reasoning. I made two observations about a certain scenario. I said they clash. And then I tried to make headway towards a solution to this kind of problem. Now at least I've get gestured at the direction that I want to go to. I want to basically challenge monotonicity. Um, I say it's monotonicity is the culprit. And I did that by basically connecting the kind of puzzle with a more familiar problem from the belief revision literature that basically puts the finger on um, preservation. And therefore, if you have a certain conception about what logical consequence is supposed to do, also on the monotonicity principle. So now I basically want to build one escape route. I want to make my um, uh, idea that monotonicity is naughty uh, um, uh, more precise and I actually want to build you basically like a simple toy model for epistemic possibility claims that is going to challenge monotonicity. So the preceding considerations were designed to motivate a dynamic approach to epistemic models and they do so because monotonicity naturally fails in dynamic semantics as I'm going to show now. We will consider a specific pro uh, setup which is called update semantics for epistemic models and then I'm going to quickly build a logic for epistemic models on that basis. Um, dynamic what? Uh, so, um, you know, there are lots of ways, you know, you can talk about dynamic semantics all day long, uh, but um, we, I won't. Um, so I just want to basically highlight a very central idea behind dynamic semantics, which starts with um, Bob Stolnaker's uh, what he calls truisms from his um, kind of seminal paper, Assertion. Um, 
So um, Stornecker basically says that, well, look, when I make an assertion in discourse, that expresses a proposition, a proposition just being, being a, a representation of the way the world is. You know, so when I say Mary is in Chicago, I'm representing the world to be a certain way. That's a proposition. That's what I said. And um, context determines which proposition is expressed basically because of indexicals. So, I mean, so if, if I say I'm hungry, so I'm not, but you know, if I say I'm hungry, then what I'm saying, the proposition that I'm expressing is different from if, you know, Elizabeth had said, like, I am hungry, you know, if she had, like, uttered I am hungry, because then she would have said that Elizabeth is hungry and uh, these facts might be correlated, but they're not the same. Um, so what proposition is expressed determines on context, but Stonecker also points out that assertions affect and are in fact intended to affect the context and how they do, of course, depends on their content. So the simple idea here is, is like that when I'm making an assertion in discourse and you don't object, it's not that the context between us remains the same. In fact, it has changed. And normally what happens is that, you know, a certain kind of proposition has become common ground between us and it's becoming like you now something like something that on which we can elaborate. So if, if I tell you that Mary is in Chicago, you don't object, and it becomes part of the common grounds that Mary is in Chicago. And we can exploit this fact, you can exploit this fact by asking questions like, oh, really, what's she doing there? Or you can say like, oh, well, that's surprising, things like that. So context, content interaction is not a one-way road. That is one of the key observations that Stornecker makes in his, principle, in his paper assertion. Now, Stornecker has a very um, peculiar, no, not peculiar, but a very special, very distinct view about how our theory about you know, language is supposed to capture this kind of aspects of context content interaction. So, specifically, Stornecker thinks that how context determines assertory content, that's something that your semantics has to tell you. Um, how assertory content affects the content, context, so the other direction of the context content interaction. That is something that pragmatics has to tell you, theory of pragmatics. So semantics only for Stornecker has to deal with one direction of context content interaction, okay? Um, and that's, you know, a, a view that you can have, but the dynamic semanticist is uh, claiming or proposing that both directions of the context content interaction are actually relevant for semantic theorizing. So semantics then becomes no longer the kind of thing that's basically just going to um, talk about truth conditions all the time, but it's really focusing on how um, an, an expression or a sentence or what if you relates an input context, i.e. the context in which the utterance is made, to an output context. So in dynamic semantics, semantic values are not specified using truth conditions, but they are specified using what we might call context change potentials. So this, you know the meaning of a sentence, not if you know what has to be the case for it to be true, but rather you know the meaning if you know like, okay, if this is the context in which I am, what does it take to basically update the context with that um, sentence? There are various forms of dynamic semantic systems, file change semantics, during the time, discord representation theory from going back to come, dynamic predicate logic, and update semantics from Weltman. We will focus here on update semantics with the understanding that there are alternative uh, frameworks out there um, as well. Um, just a little bit of prep work. Um, a possible world, um, uh, which Elizabeth alluded to, is just for me just a function from atomic sentences to truth values, but even easier, Atomic facts. It's basically a complete collection of all the atomic facts. That's what a possible world is, um, if you want to think about it like that. Um, an information state is just a set of possible worlds, a set of possible worlds compatible with the information that the state S um, carries. And it is consistent just in case, well, there's at least one possible way the world could be that is, uh, you know, compatible with it. So basically means that, you know, if you are if you, if, if you, the information that is the empty set, then you're just, you're just too interesting. You've ruled out everything. So, um, you know, I could throw in some philosopher jokes, but not, not right now. Uh, uh, you know, alluding to certain philosophers. But, uh, so that's already enough for me to f uh, specify an update function, which very creatively I've used the plus, which takes an information state S and a sentence phi, 
and returns an information state, the result of what I call the result of updating S with phi. Um, and I have like my basic, uh, for atomic sentences, uh, oh sorry, my basic language is, um, ah, oh, there's one bullet point missing. Uh, the basic language just includes my atomic sentences and my connectives. And um, I can always talk about the proposition that for any atomic sentence I can talk about the set of uh, the proposition it expresses, which is just a set of possible worlds at which P is true. Okay, so that's it. Um, that's my prep. So now I can basically just um, shoot out the rules. Um, so the semantics, as I said, is now going to be given in terms of update rules. Um, so, for example, the result of updating a state of information with an atomic sentence is just basically the intersection of that information state with the proposition expressed. Which is just to say that, you know, if you update with the information that Mary's in Chicago, then you're going to kill every possible world in which Mary's not in Chicago from your information state. Just learning stuff. Um, negation is um, set subtraction. Um, I always like to think about negation as, you know, ironic because negation works like this. So you have an information state, you update with not phi. Um, so the first thing that you do is you update with phi and then there are going to be a lot of states and like they survive the update and they're going to be super happy. And then you're going to say, no, actually you're out, the other ones are in. Um, so uh, it just works like that. Um, conjunction is basically just sequential update. First update with the first conjunct and then with the second conjunct. So these are all pretty straightforward. Uh, the, update, the update rule for the possibility statements, the might statements, is going to be a little bit funky. Um, an update with possibly phi is basically what we call a test. It runs a test on the input state and it's going to return an input state um, on, you know, depending on the outcome. So there are basically two possible outcomes that you get from an update with possibly phi. Either the original information state or the empty set, the absurd state. And so it depends on what the test outcome was. Whether the state passes the test imposed by the possibility statement or not. Um, so specifically phi, uh, possibly phi is going to test whether or not the prejacent, I mean the phi, is compatible with the information state. If it is, then the state has passed the test and you just get back the original information state. If it's not, then the test is failed and you get back the empty set. I have um, a notational variant of this update rule on the handout, which is basically, you know, a little bit more perspicuous in that case, because it's really splitting up the two cases and the condition next to it. But these are really equivalent to that. So possibly P, for example, you know, Mary might be in Chicago, is going to test the input state and it's basically going to ask, in this case, whether or not there is a possible world in the information state of which Mary is in Chicago. If it is, then the test is passed and you just get back the original information state. If in all possible worlds Mary is not in Chicago, then the test is failed and so you get basically a crash, a crash notice. Um, not surprisingly then, must is also running a test as well. That basically tests whether or not the projacent is entailed by the information carried by the input state and is going to return the original input state or the empty set back for that. And that's more or less it. Um, I want to talk about commitment. That was, you know, pointed out what means commitment here. Um, I'm going to say that in this semantics, a state is committed to phi just in case basically updating with phi is going to what we call idle. It's basically fixed point. You just get back the original information state. And that is just the information that the information carried by phi is already carried by the information state. And importantly here, consider now something like a very simple uh, system in which um, W marries in Chicago and at V she is not in Chicago, okay? So take that state. That is already, already a witness for our original modesty principle because that state is um, committed to um, um, Mary possibly being in Chicago, because there is a possible world of which she is in Chicago. But the state is neither committed to Mary being in Chicago, because there is a world in which she's not. 
And she, the state is not committed to Barry not being in Chicago because there's a possible world in which, of which she is in Chicago. Okay? So that is just a modest information state. Um, the result of updating with Mary not being in Chicago is just going to be V, right? Because that's the only possible world of which she's not in Chicago. And note here that while the state, the original information state S, is was committed to the possibility statement that she is in Chicago, the result of updating it with not C is no longer committed to the possibility that Mary is in Chicago, because if I update, you know, if I update um, W V with possibly C, I'm going to just get back the original information state because the update with um, C is going to be consistent. So that's fine. So that's why S is committed to possibly uh, to Mary to the claim that Mary might be in Chicago. But of course, once I've strengthened the information state with the information that she's not in Chicago, updating with the claim that Mary might be in Chicago is going to lead to a crash, right? Uh, because I only have no V in it, and updating that with C is going to give me back the, em the empty state, OK? So that you should already smell preservation failure here. Um, uh, that is not strictly speaking preservation failure, yet for the simple reason that so far I'm only talking about plus, and preservation was concerned with circ with a circle. But assume that there is something like easy revision. That is another principle that actually I think goes back to Levi. Um, so that if S is not committed to not phi, then the result of revising S with phi is just going to be the result of updating S with phi. Um, that is just to say, and this is what basically one of the background reading that I um, suggested um, from, from Gillis, so long as you're not committed to not phi, revising with phi just amounts to simple learning that phi, which is just, you know, the updating. Then you actually get a preservation failure um, out of that. Because we call that S is committed to Mary might be in Chicago. It is not committed to Mary actually being in Chicago. So in that case, the result of revising S with not C is just, you know, the result of updating S with not C. And that result of revising S with not C is no longer committed to possibly to the claim that Mary might be in Chicago. And that is exactly contrary to what preservation requires. So once you have easy revision, you can link up my update system with the revision system. And I get preservation failures um, out of that. So preservation is going to fail in that system as you know, intended. What about monotonicity? Well, in order to tell you that, I just need to add one more thing. I need to say what logical consequence amounts to. Um, if you think about logical consequence as we did as some kind of preservation of commitment, I mean not preservation, but preservation of commitment, in the sense that if you've come to accept the premises, you are rationally committed to accepting the conclusion, then you can think about logical consequence as saying that a set of premises entails psi just in case for every information state that you could be in, if you've updated that information state with the premises, then you're going to be committed to psi. And this is often called update to test consequence. Um, in my, you know, the one of the papers that I suggested, I point to some uh, alternatives that are out there that have been out there for a while, but we will just go uh, with that one. Um, I'm also going to say that phi 1 till phi n is consistent just in case I have some information state uh, that can be consistent, that can be updated with the premises in that order without resulting in uh, the empty set. Okay, so how am I doing with time? Good. Okay, and now you can already observe monotonicity failures. Um, I'm going to choose a very boring example, but you can see, for example, that possibly P, or you know, it might be that P entails, it might be that P. Take my word for it. Um, but we also know, we know, and I've shown you, that um, possibly P updated with not P is no longer, is, does not entail possibly P. Um, 
Because, you know, recall, for example, that if you, you know, just our original information table just had, you know, W and V in it, right? Updating that with possibly P is going to return the original information state. So that is committed. Then I update with not P, and that information state is actually, if I update them uh, with not, if I update that state with possibly P again, I will just get back a crash. You know, I'm going to get like a non-trivial change of that. So, um, and you know, this is just a formal articulation of the already this kind of preservation failure that I've pointed out earlier. So that is going to give me um, monotonicity failures. And I hope that all of that, I mean, even though I've written down formulas and so on, should be perfectly intuitive because I gave you a reason to not believe in preservation. I basically hooked up my logical consequence relation so that it basically is the kind of thing that, you know, is about belief revision. Yeah? I said, well, preservation isn't good about belief revision, so monotonicity is not going to be good for logical consequence because they are so closely linked to each other. So this is just, you know, the formal result which is articulating um, a very important uh, intuition that I had. And in fact, uh, failure of monotonicity closely connects with preservation failures. In fact, I can show that there are, you know, uh, you will get certain kind of preservation failures only if um, you have a monotonicity failure. I'm going to skip that little uh, two points here in the interest of time. Um, and instead, want to go back to the puzzle a little bit. So, um, uh, so, so basically, what I've done is to give you a system in which monotonicity is going to fail. This would be a terrible talk uh, if I wouldn't basically have enough time to go back to the puzzle and show why it shows the puzzle. And it takes this to be um, a necessary condition. Whether it's sufficient, that's up for you to decide. But. Uh, I want to at least go back to the puzzle really quick. Um, I need to do one more thing. I need to tell you what it means to update with a conditional. I'm going to uh, take this opportunity to talk about the very famous Ramsey test that philosophers and um, you know, you know, lots of people working in the formal literature like. Um, so Ramsey very in the early 30s suggested basically, well, what does it actually take to evaluate a conditional? Well, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> What you need to do is to basically, what we do is we basically assume the antecedent of the conditional and then check whether or not the consequent follows, whether we accept the consequent on that basis. So this is really like a test procedure. So really Ramsey talks about we check whether or not we would accept the consequent under, that, um, under the assumption of the antecedent. So if you want to check whether or not if Mary's in Chicago, then Bob is in New York, do you accept that? Well, you accept it just in case, well, assume that Mary is in Chicago. Do you accept hypothetically on that basis that Bob is in New York? If yes, then you're going to accept the conditional. If not, you're not going to accept the conditional. You're going to reject it. So um, that suggests then that when I ask whether or not, you know, what, what is a conditional, that's actually going to run a test of my information state as well. It is basically going to ask whether or not under the assumption of the antecedent, meaning under an update, with phi, you are committed, you accept the consequent psi. So that is just, you know, really like taking the Ramsey test very literally, and this is something that you can do in dynamic semantics. In fact, this is going to give you modus ponens by design given update to test consequence. Because, you know, suppose that any state support uh, survives the test with if phi then psi. That basically means that if you update it with phi, it's going to be committed to psi. Now suppose that you do update it with phi, then of course the resulting state is going to be committed to psi. That's just what the conditional asked you uh, um, to make sure. So that is going to really hardwire modus ponens um, as a rule of inference and, and therefore already is going to give me my second observation that modal conditionals are supposed to support modus ponens. So my second observation about modus ponens gets a check mark. So now I basically have to check whether or not on this kind of system actually I do get my uh, um, oh, sorry. Uh, my consistency claims. Oh. So these were again my five premises and I wanted to see whether or not I can find uh, whether I can make them to be consistent. Well in my system the question is then whether or not I can find a state that can be updated with these premises without resulting in the empty set of possible worlds. 
Recall, that's also on your handout, that's just what consistency um, takes. Question is, can I find such a state? Well, I bet I do because otherwise, again, I could go home and cry. But fortunately, um, um, I looked around for a long time and found one. Um, actually, you don't need to look around that much. Just take, you know, basically the original state we had. At W, Mary's in Chicago. She's not in New York. At V, she is in New York and uh, not in Chicago. And let's just take the state SP to be of that form, consist of W and V. So clearly, that state is supporting my exclusive OR. Because the exclusive OR, the statement that she is in Chicago or in New York but not in both cities, is true at every possible well. Clearly, it supports both of my possibility claims. Because in virtue of W, uh, the first possibility claim is going to pass. And in virtue of the second one, the second possibility claim is going to pass. All good. And also, because there is no possible world at which she is in Chicago and in New York, the claim that she might be in Chicago and in New York is going to result in a crash, and therefore the update with the negation is going to result in the original information state. So that statement, the last one, the, the fifth one, is actually going to be supported as well. And now, finally, observe that you know, if I update as with the information that Mary is not in Chicago, uh, that is going to support then that she must be in New York because that's the only possible world left and that is one of which she is in New York. So the, conditional, so the information that actually also supports my conditional, if she's not in Chicago, then she must be in New York. And for parallel reasons, she's also supporting the, the conditional that if she's not in New York, then she must be in Chicago. So since S is consistent and in fact updating with all of these premises is going to just return S, I have proven uh, that, you know, these premises are in fact consistent. Um, in fact, the information state is supporting all of these premises, which is just exactly what we uh, wanted. So, I have now a system which satisfies my constraints. Um, let me just finally, you know, go back to the question of, okay, where did I make the mistake in my original line of reasoning when I presented the puzzle for classical logic? So if I again, you know, let my sigma be my set of sentences, remember that I reasoned as follows. I said something like this. All right, so since um, these premises support that if she's not in Chicago, then she must be in New York, then if I strengthen that set with that she's not in Chicago, she must be in New York, I'm committed to that. Good, that's still going to hold. Um, uh, so uh, then, you know, via duality and this kind of stuff, I reason my claim, okay, so since um, under the assumption that she's not in Chicago, she must be in New York. Well, that basically means that she cannot be in Chicago and uh, that, that she must not be in Chicago and therefore that under the assumption of not C, she cannot be in Chicago. That's still going to hold as well. Good. Um, so that's how far I got. And now remember what I said back in the days. I said, well, since Sigma is committed to uh, the claim that she might be in Chicago under the assumption that she's not in Chicago, she still might be in Chicago because of monotonicity. That's exactly where uh, I'm, I'm going to cut the argument, right? Um, but that is, you know, rejecting monotonicity. Um, so then, you know, I basically had like this kind of, then I continued, I basically said, okay, you know, uh, under the assumption of not C, I'm going to get um, my contradiction out of that, and so therefore by reductio, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, that step doesn't follow anymore because, you know, I basically already cut the argument at this point. Um, uh, side note, reductio as an argument rule is actually going to still hold in uh, dynamic um, semantics. It's really that monotonicity is going to be the point where we're going to cut. So here, monotonicity really um, saves uh, the day. How much time did I? So, okay. So, um, so then, um, uh, let me uh, actually go into the uh, um, Dolce then. Um, so what happened here, what I tried to do is that, you know, I wanted to point out that epistemic models do pose a challenge to the classical model of modal reasoning. 
And I made a point here that this challenge is actually arguably related to a classical problem from the belief revision literature. Uh, that kind of outlook basically allowed me to motivate a solution to the challenge by rejecting uh, monotonicity. Um, dynamic semantics uh, was an, uh, something like a semantic foundation for this non-monotonic model of uh, reasoning. So what I try to do here is to um, basically put together considerations from logic, philosophy of language, linguistics, etc. Um, to solve a problem for um, modal reasoning. Um, the big picture here that I want you to take home is that so reasoning is a topic of interest for philosophers and logicians, at least, you know, traditionally. Um, um, the dynamic semantics was originally a topic of interest for linguists. So, you know, originally they cared about things like anaphora resolution, presupposition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Part of what I want to, you know, take home message here, especially since it's such an interdisciplinary conference here uh, in school, is that there is like something like a very fruitful interaction here between um, linguistically informed semantic theories, theories about meaning as a foundation uh, for a theory of reasoning applied to a remarkably rich um, topic. So there's much more uh, to be done, but I gotta um, stop here and instead, you know, just point to the a little bit of additional literature that other questions that have been pointed out in the literature and um, tell you that there's more work to be done. So just thank you and uh, get some more work done. Thank you.